Hey everybody, welcome to LED Live. Have you ever wondered, is there a connection between climate change and religion? Find out on this episode of LED Live. So welcome back. Today's discussion is going to be a good one, and I get a chance to have a very special guest today. Brock Meyer is my brother, and so he's been on the show before, so this isn't his first time, but welcome back, Brock. Yeah, thank you. Thank and we're you. excited because um, the topic that you're bringing to the table here is one that I think a lot of people have questions on. And, you know, they, they see that the world is gearing up, or should I say falling apart mm. at some point, and we, we know that this has to be foretold in the Bible, right? Mm. That we're going to get to this place. But how do we know how to apply it, how to not? I think that's what, what I'm really excited to find out today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is such a huge topic because climate affects every aspect of our lives. I mean, not just in the weather, but I mean, the social climate, the political climate, um, and even the actual physical climate. And so, yeah, I, I think a lot of us are wondering what in the world is happening as we're watching the world fall apart around us. And it's something special to, to us as well as, as a ministry for G the Gideon Rescue Company because we see this is, our, this is our whole field is responding to disasters and we're seeing them explode across the board like never before. Um, so people are asking those questions. So tell, tell them a little bit, for those that don't know who Gideon Rescue is, what is Gideon Rescue and, and what, what, what is it, this ministry that you're working for? Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's a disaster response um, volunteer team and we go in and, and try to help where we can, but we have, a, we have a bigger mission because it's one thing to just physically respond to disasters, but uh, we, we really have a burden to share with people um, hope for what's coming. You know, even in the darkest moment, in the crisis that they may be facing, we want to give them solid hope, solid information, biblical information that they can hang on to and say, you know what, um, I may have lost everything, I may have lost loved ones, I may have lost property, but uh, God has a plan and I can see how he's working out that plan to rescue me, not just not just for today, but for eternity. So you've responded to some, like what, what kind of things have you guys done, the disasters? We've been to a lot of big storms, you know, hurricanes, tornadoes, that's, uh, that's always a big one. Um, Hurricane uh, Dorian in the Bahamas. Mm. Um, and uh, these storms are just, I mean, they're, they're, they're exploding across the, the board. Even the experts can't keep up. So, I mean, you know, like w they, they project their model and they say, oh, this is going to be a category one hurricane. And overnight it becomes a category five hurricane. Well, wow. which is um, biblical, right? I mean, you're seeing natural disasters more frequently and more intense, right. and you're seeing it firsthand. Right, exactly. Well, uh, talk a little bit about the bah the Bahamas because that was kind of, I mean, every one of these disasters, they always say, this is unprecedented. I've never right. seen anything like this in my life. But talk a little <laughs> bit about what made that one unique. Well, you know, from eyewitness accounts, that that's what was really um, actually surprising even to us because we knew it was a, a large storm. It was a Category 5 storm that sat over the Bahamas. It was really uncharacteristic. It didn't move off the Bahamas. It just sat and churned right over the Bahamas. Wow. And we were speaking to a, um, a, a dear saint. Uh, she was there being evacuated, and she, she actually told us some interesting things. Uh, number one, she said this was not a storm that anybody had ever seen because they're used to hurricanes in the Bahamas. I mean, mm -hmm. they've seen hurricanes before. Some of the older generation, they've been through some large Category 4 and Category 5 storms. She said this was a very different storm because in the middle of the storm, not only was a Category 5 hurricane, but they, they, they reported that there were multiple tor tornadoes like coming out of the wow. sky and touching down, huge tornadoes in the middle of a hurricane. So you have a hurricane with tornado activity. Um, I mean, unprecedented. Yeah, we've never, never seen that. We've never seen that before. <laughs> and she, she went on further. She said, do you know, do you know why these things are happening? Hmm. And I thought it was really interesting. I said, well, no, like what's your perspective on this? Why do you think these things are happening? And she said, well, she said it's because the Bahamas, we claim to be a Christian nation. And she, and she said, and yet the most, evil practices happen right here in our islands. Hmm. I mean, if you follow anything about Jeffrey Epstein and all the other mm -hmm. things that have happened, mm -hmm. I mean, all that stuff happens. Like in the most beautiful, serene places, there's some really dark evil that takes place yeah. there. Um, and so she, she pointed that out. You know, she said that uh, that was a result. You know, God was, was withdrawing his mercy because, you hmm. know, yeah. they're not living up to their, uh, you know, Christian profession. Wow. That's so. an interesting perspective, and I'm sure we're going to develop that a little bit more as we get into this because, uh, <laughs> yeah, people are going to start saying the reason why some of these things are happening is because we have forgotten God. And, and I think that's the point, is that 
in the midst of incredible tragedy, all of a sudden the, the conversation shifts just from what's happening politically, physically, um, you know, to something spiritual. Right. And, and people make that connection very quickly. They're saying, well, wait a minute. Like, you know, that's why insurance companies call these things acts of God, mm, you know, natural yeah. disasters, acts of God. Um, now, obviously, is God the author of evil and destruction? No. Mm. But um, does he allow things to happen to try to get our attention and wake us up? Mm. Absolutely. Right, right, right. Nice. So what's interesting is that in Revelation 8, 11, actually, chapter 11, we have this, this verse that is just really powerful because in the context of there's these 24 elders, they're all gathered on the throne, they're worshiping God. Um, and they, they have this, this um, you know, basically song of praise that they're uttering. But at the end of that song, they, they tag this interesting line uh, in verse 18 where they say that, that uh, those that destroy the earth, them, uh, or God would destroy those that would d- destroy the earth, basically. Mm. And so it's interesting, like, does God care about our climate? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think the answer from the Bible is absolutely. Right. Like, when you go back to the beginning, like, he created Adam and Eve as yeah. basically caretakers of this earth. I mean, they were to be stewards of this earth. Mm-hmm. Um, and through, you know, obviously disobedience and transgression and the fall of man, we lost that that position to mm-hmm. take care of earth. And, and from that time, we've really been struggling. I mean, even if you look at the antediluvian world, like, you know, they really struggled with being good caretakers or good stewards of the earth. And look at what happened. I mean, the flood, yeah. right? Right. You know, it's interesting because we have a lot of technology in our world. I mean, we we can fly around. I mean, you know, they're 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 getting pretty advanced with what they're able to create, and, and yet we still have these older technologies that we know are ruining the earth, and they won't get the new ones because they're too worried about the money that they would lose in yeah. the oil companies or whatever, rather than introducing some kind of mode of travel that would be, you know, kicking out oxygen instead of carbon dioxide. You know, mm-hmm. it's like we have the technology to do these things, but often it's our selfishness that keeps us from it. So yeah, I can understand that from a biblical perspective. We are destroying the earth. If we have the power to change it and we don't, mm-hmm. it's, 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 it's us that's doing this. Yeah, and, I mean, according to the scriptures, God obviously takes that very seriously, that there actually is a time of reckoning that's coming for those that specifically destroy the earth. Right. Um, and so, you know, climate change is something that's very dear and near to God's heart. And I think it's because he's, he's put us in this position to, to be stewards and take care of, of our planet. So we don't argue with that at all. The question, though, becomes interesting because obviously in, in light of this discussion, things quickly turn to the religious. Mm-hmm. You know, like if, if, if the problem at the heart of the matter is the selfish human heart, mm-hmm. then how do you regulate that? Mm-hmm. Like, how do you put a stop to that, right? Mm-hmm. And so we're seeing this as governments and entities and churches and religions are trying to, to, you know, grapple. They're trying to wrestle with, well, how do we regulate the human heart? Well, you really can't legislate that. Yeah. You know, you can't, mm-hmm. you, you just can't. But mm-hmm. there's gonna, there's, there's obviously an attempt, right? You can mm-hmm. already start to see it where they're like, well, should we apply a carbon tax? Should we start forcing people into doing this or that? Or, um, but, you know, really it comes down to a condition of the human heart, which the only remedy, of course, is found in God's word. Have you ever heard of a sin tax? They actually call it a sin tax where they tax more on products like tobacco and alcohol and things like that. So, yeah, I can kind of see what you're, what you're talking <laughs> right. about. <laughs> right. Absolutely. We're all too policing. Yeah. 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 So, you know, it's interesting. And we've seen this, um, you know, and, and Jesus predicted this. You know, if you go back to Matthew 24, Jesus lays out like basically a roadmap because his, his disciples are asking the same question. Like, what, what, what are going to be the signs before you come? Like, we want to know, like, what are the road marks, you know, that we're going to see um, before you come? And so he lays it out. You know, Matthew 24, he says, well, the first thing he says is that many are going to come in my name. Right. And that's a real interesting fact because we've seen that. Like, the, mm-hmm. from, from the time that Jesus left to now, there, has been, there have been many, many, many people who have come claiming to be some sort of messianic figure. Yeah, yeah I remember watching all these videos. There's this dude in Australia who claimed he was Jesus. And man, this guy had tons of followers. Yeah. And it was like, really? Like People actually really believe this guy is Jesus? Totally. Yeah. And, and they do whatever he wants them to do. They yeah. give him all their money. I mean, these dudes are flying around in private planes. Yeah. It's nuts. I don't remember the exact number of people that actively claim to be Jesus now, but it's quite a few. Like, I was surprised. It was like, I don't know, 15 or something like that. People that act actively today that are claiming to be some sort of messianic figure. You got the white Jesus, the black Jesus, the yeah. Asian Jesus. The... <laughs> it's probably one yeah, in every culture. It really is an oriental one. <laughs> right. That's true. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how accurate this list is, but if you go on Wikipedia, it has it for like 18th century. 
It's like two people. Uh, <laughs> 19th century, one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, that's interesting. More than double. 20th century, uh, a lot more than six. Oh, that's so interesting. You get to the 21st century, you know, and, and there's, and it starts to be like, um, you know, from 1950 onward. Um, obviously this list isn't conclusive, but you can kind of see how it's... It's ramping up. It's increasing, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, more and more and more. I mean, you got people on here like, you know, Charles Manson and right. Sun uh, Young Moon and, and people like that. I didn't know like Charles that. Manson claimed he was Jesus. Manson? I mean, we can... <laughs> yeah, I mean, these are I mean, people claiming to be... Yeah, he wow. did in some way, whether it's reincarnated or mm-hmm. the incarnation or the second coming. Interesting. Yeah, when I saw um, that newest, uh, you guys did a show on it, on The Messiah. Netflix did a whole series on mm-hmm. The Messiah. And man, just watching the trailer, I got goosebumps. Mm-hmm. Because I was thinking in my mind, like, wow, like, not only is this in, you know, just the public's mind, but now Hollywood is picking up on it and they're driving that conversation, you know, and putting forward that, that storyline, that narrative. And what was so incredible is when you watch that trailer, a lot of it is very accurate to what you would see in our day like that Mm -hmm. whole question like how would how would the u.s government grapple with somebody who would come on the stage and say i'm like this messiah figure and it's like we know from prophecy that's going to happen you know like governments are going to have to grapple with that like you Mm -hmm. make this transition from a secular mindset to all of a sudden well wait a minute like maybe we need to have more of a religious mindset here Mm. you know the first time i watched that i i saw part of i thought it was going to be very i guess quote unquote scientific because I thought it would be just a cult. Like, like I thought the whole thing was based upon a cult. A guy who called himself a messiah. And then when it got to a point where I got to see where he actually, the guy that's the messiah guy, he looks at one of the police officers and he calls him by his first name and he starts reciting, I guess, something that happened in the guy's past with a child that got killed or something during a police raid or I don't know what it was, but... That's why I started to look at it. I'm like, okay, this is what they're pushing. It's not just something like, oh, it's a cult. Where This is a movie about cults and all that. Right. It's actually just something where they're twisting the word of God. And I'm like, well, of course they are. Yeah, right. think about how deceptive that will be when somebody's telling you very personal things. But we know that, you know, psychics and mediums and all this get information from the spirit world, you know, the, the wicked spirit world. So, yeah, somebody could really fool you. Yeah, because if there really is a demon that's following somebody around, right, and then there's another demon with the other guy, that demon could be communicating with that demon going, tell him about the guy that when he was young, you know, he had a kid. Oh, yeah, when you had a kid, and it was like, you know, he's thinking he's getting this crazy information. He could just be dictated from, you know, an evil angel. Right, right. And and what's so interesting about that, too, uh, is, um, you know, I think they, they show you you know, all of these different contexts where he shows up. Like he shows up in in the desert, you know, where there's like war and conflict. Mm. And he shows up in that tiny town in Kansas where there's a tornado, you know. And so the government agents are asking him like, you know, how is it that you're appearing in all these areas, mm. you know? And, um, and again, that whole climate, you know, whether it be political, spiritual, or physical, is driving that conversation for people to say, wow, something's happening in the world. And then here comes this figure that's just like, I have answers, mm-hmm. right? And and that's exactly, I mean, you know, a lot of the other shows and things that you guys have done as well on, you know, comics, you know, it's like mm. the whole reason why comics have been, you know, um, pushing that same narrative, you know, yeah. for a looking for that same type. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In the midst of crisis, the world's falling apart, governments are failing, you know, you name it, whatever. War is looming on the horizon. Some external threat is coming to extinguish Earth. Who comes to the forefront but a hero, right? Wow. Right. Deadpool. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like, no, right. that is not like Jesus. Right, but, but all these issues are polarizing because, you know, when you start to discuss this, and if anybody's ever been a part of a conversation about climate, just alone about the weather, good grief. You know, yeah. there's there's this opinion and that opinion, and, <laughs> yeah. and it gets polarizing real quick, and it gets emotional real quick, yeah. right? right? So yeah. it's like you're either with us or you're against us. And so all of a sudden you start to see how people get polarized, you know, and same thing. It's no, no different with, with the political climate. Or even with the social climate, right? I mean, yeah. look at, we're watching people, even here in the United States, where they are polarizing people groups against each other, mm-hmm. all for the sake of, you know, causing that conflict so that they can then, you know. There's division everywhere. Yeah. Racial division, uh, the climate change division, the corona division. Yeah, the, are you sick or not sick? That's yeah, the division. within <laughs> the church, are yeah. you saying his name correctly? It's not black Jesus, white Jesus, whatever it is. 
it's like even the 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 body of Christ is dividing on these issues that I mean we're just we're dividing everywhere so we're gonna need somebody's gonna want to step in and say yeah. we need to unite and so, there was actually a report that came out where a guy on a plane actually got up and he threatened to kill everyone on the plane as Alaska Airlines if they did not um, if they did not realize and say that Jesus was black like literally uh, he was going there it's like I'm gonna kill everybody on this plane and I'm like what 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 makes you do that like it doesn't matter who you are what race you are whatever just what pushes you to say those things right it's right it's, and a lot of it's just a subtle twist it's a misunderstanding right mm -hmm. I mean it's like we only have one race it's yeah, the human race, race right yeah. I mean it's like there's no there's no when you start to say oh I'm part of this race and that race no we don't have six different races or mm -hmm. ten different races on this planet we have one race there's neither Jew nor Greek yeah, one all family one in right? Christ Jesus yeah, yeah. So what's amazing is that it's just that subtle twist in the conversation where they, they polarize people. And it's because they're trying to create this tension yeah. because they have a different agenda. They want to bring somebody that's going to unite everybody back together and to say, hey, look, we have a solution yeah. in the face of everything that's happening. The world's falling apart. Politics are falling apart. Religion's falling apart. All these things are, are going downhill. Well, we have a solution for this. Yeah. And people are so tired. I mean, I, I, th I really genuinely believe everybody, it doesn't matter what side of the issue you're on, I think people are getting tired of seeing such division and crisis across the board. Yeah. yeah. I don't even like getting on Facebook anymore. Man. I know. I'm just like, I, oh, I know. It's like, it. it's like on to the next thing, on to the next thing. And it's, it's like when the whole racial issue was happening, I mean, people were just like, coronavirus, forget that. It's yeah. on to this like <laughs> totally knee jerk mm -hmm. um, uh, other thing. And then that kind of fizzes out and dies down. And so it's like, now quick, go back to the coronavirus. Yep. Second <laughs> yeah. wave. The guy that died, he had coronavirus. Yeah. yeah. I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> They're like, oh, now there's riots and all yeah. these things happening. And it's very selective. We see that even people in the media also, they are almost corroborating with a lot of these other people the agenda. Maybe unknowingly they think that this is a noble cause but there's something more sinister behind it and right. it's just sowing division and just yeah, so what's division. interesting is that jesus actually points out this this is maybe a shocker to many but jesus actually points out that this is just the beginning mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so that, that to me and and that's that's hard to wrap my mind around because right. i mean like we've been through 2020 has been an incredibly <laughs> Right. Busy, crazy, right. Right. This has been the just longest century awful right. start to a year. First right? time I ever went into a bank wearing a mask, dude. I was just <laughs> right. like, this, right. is, <laughs> this is wild. Yeah. I know. Like, I, your entire life they tell you, like, don't wear a mask. You know, you right. could be yeah. taken for the wrong person. Right. And you now it's into, like, man. 2019, I guarantee you, you walk into a bank with a mask on, you would be on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> I walked into a store, yeah. uh, Dollar right. Tree, actually. Right. And the people looked at me, and I saw the fear in their eyes. I was wearing a hood. And a mask, and they looked at me, and I, I'm thinking, oh, it's probably they didn't think I'm gonna rob. But they just, I remembered we're in a pandemic. Never <laughs> we're mind. In a pandemic. Mm. It's okay. I'm only here for the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So, but it, it, this is the beginning, right? Yeah. I mean, there's much more to come, and and that's what is incredible when you think. But there's a shift, and and in the context of Matthew 24, Jesus actually he he, he describes this because in verse nine he says that it goes from all these external signs where we see war, famine, pestilence you know, earthquakes, diverse places, all of that. So all of a sudden he says that, that they're going to persecute mm. God's people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, like, if we're seeing all these things happen, then, then we know it's, it's a roadmap. It, and you can That's follow next. it chronologically. What's next? Next stop. Persecution. Next, the conversation shifts from all these external signs that are happening around us to all of a sudden, who can we blame? Yeah. Who can we blame? Yeah. Why is this happening? Yeah. And there's somebody that's not doing what they should be doing. Yeah. Them. It's yeah. interesting that humanity has been playing the the blame game since the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Right. 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 And in every situation, each uh, character involved, if you will, they were the one to blame. Right. Mm -hmm. Nobody else. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to take responsibility. Right. So in all of this, who is to blame? I am. You yeah. are. Yeah. You know? And in, and in many ways, you know, the people who went before us and were, yeah, we're in this world now. Jesus is getting ready to come soon. We're, we're the product of many people's choices in some ways. We didn't do those things. You know, we're here now dealing with the consequences, mm. but we still contribute, right? Yeah. And uh, ever, nobody wants to take responsibility. You know, sin is so destructive, and I, I just, I don't think we ever really fully grasp just yeah. how destructive it is. I mean, one wrong choice, right? And the whole world is thrown into chaos. 
And this whole controversy, I think, has been really underlying, underscoring that point, is that sin is so toxic. It can't, it can't survive. You know, in God's plan for the future, there can't be sin, right? Yeah, yeah. So that he's on a mission to, to prove that, you know, he can actually rescue a people and a people can trust him no matter what, right? And make right decisions no matter what, even in the face of incredible pressure, incredible odds, when everybody else around them is, you know, in chaos, can we stand and make, you know, the right decision? Mm-hmm. Um, Only with his help. That's yeah. right. That's right. So, you know, the Bible actually, you know, we actually have a story in the Bible where this actually happens. This, this very situation happens on a mini scale, which has, I think, large implications for where we are now. And it comes from 1 Kings 18. If you remember, uh, Israel was in a dire famine. You know, things were not going well. Um, it, it hadn't rained, actually, in Israel for the space of three and a half years, I believe is what it was, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Ahab, of course, is searching high and low for Elijah because Elijah was the one that pronounced that it's not going to rain now. Oh, wow. Uh. You know. And, uh, and so he's trying to find Elijah. Can't find Elijah. God hides Elijah by the brook. Remember, he's fed by ravens, that whole story. Well, there comes a point where God, you know, says, okay, now it's time to show yourself and, and declare to the king that, you know, this whole showdown that is, is, is coming together between those that worship God and those that worship man's system. Mm. And, um, and so it's really amazing because, you know, Ahab actually finally finds Elijah and he actually, out of his mouth, the very first thing he tells Elijah is like, are you the one that's troubling Israel? Like he's casting the blame. Like, you know, all of our problems, the drought, it's not me, right? Just like mm-hmm. you're saying, like, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not going to take responsibility for this, even though Ahab is like the super wicked king. He's married to Jezebel, mm. you know, but he totally calls Elijah out and is like, you're the one that's causing all these problems in Israel. Oh. You know? I like how Elijah answers that. It's like, no, dude, you are the one that, you know, has caused us trouble. Right? But you see the shift, right? The, in the climate context, you see this shift where all of a sudden persecution is now on the table, right? Where it's like, yeah. okay, I found you. And, you know, now, now there's going to be a reckoning. Like, we're, we're going to deal with this. It's interesting because he recognized... I mean, he's literally validating that Elijah had the power to, to, to stop that. I mean, by saying you're the one that caused this or stopped yeah. it, right? And you wanted to fix it. He's trying to find him to kill him, thinking right. that that's going to fix it. Not thinking that, you know what I mean? Like, well, what really caused this? Yeah. Where, you know, go to Elijah and say, what, what happened here? Right. And Elijah, I think, told him in the very beginning, right? It's right. because you have, you know, forgotten God and there's right. going to be neither dew nor rain till, you know you guys wow. know who the true God is. So right. I think he knew the problem, but he was ascribing the wrong thing. Yeah, so it's, it's amazing. Like the whole, the whole context of the story with Elijah and Ahab is this showdown over worship, true worship. And that's eventually what actually comes out in the story is, you know, Elijah basically tells Ahab, hey, you bring your system of worship and I'll show up with my system of worship and let's see who basically is God. And what's interesting is that, you know, Baal was, of course, the deity that they were worshiping at the time. And Baal is, is the lord of the dew and the rain. So it's like this god that is supposed to be able to provide fertility, not just physically, but, you know, everything else can't perform. Um, and so there was a lot on the line, you know, this whole false system that, that Elijah was up against. So maybe the blame was like, Elijah's not worshiping Baal, and Baal's mad or something. Right, so. exactly. You know, and the pressure there, you know, it's mm. like, well, if we get rid of this guy who's the hindrance, yeah. then, then Baal will be happy. Everything's back to normal. And he'll send the rain. You know, this whole concept, you know, of true worship, false worship, and this showdown that happens on Mount Carmel, um, you know, projecting into now today, like, what does this have, you know, weight or bearing on us today? Like, are we headed in a similar direction? Would we see similar, you know, a similar struggle between true worship and false worship? Yeah, I hadn't thought of it, but when you read that, I was just like, boom, like the parallels, like, yeah, it's going to come a time when it'll be like, if you don't worship this way, then you're the problem because, you know, this world is, actually, I seen an article where the Pope said that the coron- the coronavirus was Mother Earth having a fit over climate change. Mm. I'm like, whoa, why do we have this religious leader saying... The virus right. is Mother Earth having a fit over what we're doing to the climate. Yeah, Mother Earth, mm. little New Age Mother terminology Earth, yeah. there. Yeah. 
Well, it's interesting you bring that up because um, you know it wasn't too long ago that that uh, Pope Francis released you know Laudato Si or Laudato Si, the encyclical, the, the encyclical yeah. that he released, um, and it was all specifically on climate change. Now, embedded in there, interestingly enough, was a really strong push for returning to Sunday observance in connection with the Eucharist. Yeah, um, They've actually come out in the news, what is it, maybe a few weeks now, um, where they were really starting to publicly say, you know, look at everybody's had time off. Yep. Look at how nice this is. You get this day of family. We should keep this going. This is great for the environment. So you can uh, kind of already see in our world, they're all preparing for this day and it's marching more towards the, you know, pretty soon it's going to be, not just a good idea to take this off, you need to take this off. Now, if you don't take this off, you're yeah. fighting against the status quo. Yeah. Well, they've, they've been capitalizing on it all over the world. Like, you know, if you look at, um, I think it was Venice, you know, which has in the past not been known for the cleanest water. You know, you go to Venice, you get the gondola, you ride down the little canal, it's mm -hmm. awesome. But they've actually had a, a whole influx of marine life because they haven't had tourism. And so all their boats uh, and the traffic have been shut down and their waters have cleared up. And all mm -hmm. these fish and dolphins and other things have returned. And so it's like a case study where everybody's been like, look, like if we shut things down, you know, like look what happens. Like the environment repairs itself. And so there will be a strong push, yeah. you know, for, you know, what we, we, we've been pushing too hard. We, industrialization, commercialization, all these things, which is true. Mm -hmm. like if you look at it, like in a lot of ways, we have way overblown our boundaries when it comes yeah. to consuming goods and manufacturing goods yeah. because of greed, because of selfishness, because of the that I want to buy it now and I want it to show up my house two days later. And if it doesn't, good grief, you know, like it's a problem. <laughs> yeah. right. I, really, I really think that life would, though life would not be perfect on earth, it would be a lot better compared to now if just a few of the things were not part of our character and not part of who we were as human beings. So selfishness, right. greed, all those things. If that was taken out of us, I would say today, if God just took that out of us today, I bet you the world would become way better, not perfect, but way better than it was before we had that. And it's just, that's just what it is. We destroy ourselves. We break everything that we touch. So. Yeah. And so what's so fascinating is that is that in this discussion, the things that are being proposed and brought forward, they're not bad. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of the principles they're bringing forward, like, you know what? We need a day of rest. You know, that that's not a bad thing. In right. fact, God actually says that in scripture that, right. you know, you should rest one day out of seven. Now, specifically, that being the Sabbath, you know, yeah, is what he's right. commanded. But this is where the twist, again, it's just, just a subtle little mm -hmm. change to say, well, no, it's not Sabbath. It's Sunday observance mm -hmm. in connection with the Eucharist that is going to give us, you know, rest and actually change some things. Seems like I remember reading with that Italy thing, too. They were not going to go back to business as usual. Like, they were purposely going to be less commercialized and, and things like that. I remember also seeing shortly after all the, you know, pandemic broke out and it was about a month of things in populated areas just, you know, dying down, people not out and about and all this. All of a sudden you see these satellite images being released. Look, all this CO act, CO2 activity has gone way down. Mm. Look, the ozone layer is healing itself, mm. you know, all these evidences that are going to be used at a later time to prove this is why we need to Man uh, have a day of have a day of rest they could they could say it's like a enforced quarantine day or something i, I mean i've right. seen there's a website called greensabbath.org i think and there's a lot of that talk in there talking about one day off uh car free sundays i actually saw a news clip of it was in canada and they were talking about this grocery store that was going to close down on every Sunday. And, and they were interviewing people in the parking lot. They're like, yeah, we need to get back to this. We used to do this, you know, but we've gotten away from it. And I think this is a, a wake up call. We need to get back to that, you know. And one lady mentioned it being the Lord's Day and things like that. It's weird seeing all that, you know, hearing that talk like that. It's interesting the difference in the way God does things and the way Lucifer does things. Mm -hmm. God says, this is the way it works best. Mm -hmm. If you don't do it that way there's consequences, right? right? You can go to Galatians 6, 7. It says, God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, he reaps. Yeah. And Satan's way of doing things, it, it runs kind of parallel to God's. You know, he kind of starts out that day, that way. He'll, he'll dangle the carrot, you know, the golden carrot. You know, I really want you to go along with this. Here's a bribe, all that kind of stuff. But when the rubber meets the road, instead of him saying, this is the consequence, he's like, no, nope, you're not going to do it my way. I'm going to force you to do it my way. Right. 
no matter what. And you just don't have a choice. Right. With God, you always have a choice. Yeah. You may not like the outcome, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Because that's, you chose something that's going to result in death or, you know, dire consequences. But you always get a choice with mm. God. Yeah. Always. Mm. And that's such a great point. God is one of the biggest protectors of freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. Like to, to his detriment, yeah. he will protect mm -hmm. the freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're right on that because, you know, this is how you can differ differentiate between those two systems. Man's system of worship doesn't mm -hmm. involve a free choice. It's compulsion. You know, it's strongly recommended maybe at the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's socially pressured maybe at the beginning. But eventually, it's mandated. And eventually, if you don't follow the mandate, then it's legislated. If then if you don't follow the legislation, then you're executed. I mean, it, it, that's the way that it plays out. Constantine did that. Yeah. He, like, mm -hmm. he outlawed the Sabbath, but then he said um, it's recommended to keep Sunday. And then you start seeing these laws about all the shops must be closed on the venerable day of the sun mm -hmm. and all this. Yeah. You may have to fact check me on this one, but I'm pretty sure I remember reading that typically the Jews long time ago were, were more or less like two meal a day type people until it came to Sabbath. And Sabbath was like three meals, we're feasting, we're so Feast happy, days. it's great. You know, we're celebrating. Early church, you know, started with Jewish nation, Jewish, Jewish converts started, you know, moving into Gentiles. And one of the tools that was used was... Um, Sabbath, the Sabbath day became a day of fasting. Mm. And over time, Sunday became a day of feasting, right? right? Mm. That celebration that, that went with it. And so you, you, you take away, <clears throat> you can see like with Sabbath, there's the family element, there's the feasting element, there's the celebration element. You remove those things mm. and shift them to somewhere else. And all of a sudden, Sabbath's not so popular anymore, right? Yeah. Who'd want to do that? That's right. so lame. You see the same kind of methodology or technique being applied, you know, in the Bible in the last days. You know, what is Sunday going to become? It's going to become a day of family. It's going to become a wow. day of feasting, yeah. a day of celebration, right? Yeah. So why would anybody want to do anything on Sabbath, you know? Yeah. Well, it's interesting, mm -hmm. too. Like, why, why does it have to be Sunday? Like, why wouldn't they just say, hey, if you take a day yeah, off. Pick your day. Yeah, pick your day. If you want to take <laughs> Tuesday off, what's the deal with Tuesday? You're still not using as much carbon whatever. <laughs> now, now, you bring up a great point. The question, yeah. why, why does it have to be Sunday? And if you actually go back and this is maybe a whole other topic for another show. <laughs> but when you go back, the, the Bible's very specific, very clear, in that there's this beast power in Revelation 13 that desires to change times and law. Oh, yeah. And so there's this controversy where God has set his seal of approval upon the Sabbath, which mm -hmm. he's you know, originally mandated from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden there's this power that tries to usurp that authority and say, nope, this is the day that we are going to command as the day of worship. Yeah. Um, and as, the, as those two entities, of course, are battling for the hearts and minds of men, that's where we get caught in the whole decision, you know, who are we going to obey? Are we going to be like Elijah on Mount Carmel mm -hmm. and stand firm for truth, even though it seems like everybody else is bought into this system? Like even Elijah bought into that. He was like, I'm the only one left. Yeah. You know, God, every, God. everybody else is, you know, well, what, bought into the system. What other religious political figure has been invited to the United Nations to address this thing? Only the Pope. Right. You know, he's the face of it. And, um, and to answer your question about why, why this one day, why can't each of you just take whatever day you want? Because you have to have everybody off in order to shut the factory down or whatever. Otherwise, my day isn't your day. I got to work, so the factory has to keep going. So they have to pick a day. And what, what's the best day to pick? Well, the mail doesn't run on Sunday. The DMV is shut down on Sunday. You know, it's like everything's already shut down on that day. Like Keith was saying, you think, oh, this is the day of family. What do you think about Saturday? The busiest day of the week. The busiest day of the week. Yeah. Mm. Most shopped on. Yeah. Most going to the clubs and all this. Yeah. It's complete opposite. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. right. yeah, you, you, yeah. You know, it is very interesting. You think of like what transpires from Friday night to Saturday night. Yeah. Mm. I mean, the world, that's their time to like, you know, cut party. loose and party, party and do whatever, you know, go out. You tell them to stay home. Yeah, right. And you a, know, a lot I'll of sleep them in at, on Sunday. A lot that's of them what at church. The they rest say, of the world yeah. is thinking. Yeah, Roger Morneau, he actually speaks about um, in an interview that Sunday, uh, Sabbath is the Lord's Day. And he was told by a priest that Sunday, the great master was what they called Satan. 
he actually chose Sunday as his day of worship, and that Sunday was Satan's day of worship. Right. Interesting. Yeah, Roger Moore, no, he was like in the secret society and stuff. Came, mm-hmm. Had a really good documentary and book and everything. Mm-hmm. Definitely something to look into. Yeah. A lot of people look at Sabbath and say, oh, that, you know, that's for the Jews. Um, you know, something God instituted for them. But if you go way back in a creation story, that's the first time you see the Sabbath commandment. Yeah. And there's nothing in the Sabbath commandment that's inherently Jewish. Mm-hmm. Not at all. Right. There's nothing there that like would indicate anything Jewish at all. It's a universal right. for all mankind. If you boil it down to the simplest terms, it's rest and provide rest for those around you and even animals. In other words, it's a rest. It's it's not like lay around and be sleepy and do nothing. You know, it's not that kind of rest. But it's don't enforce others to be working you or others around you. I mean, there's so many parallels when you look at the Bible. That's what I like about, you know, you can't just take one thing out of the Bible and all of a sudden build your entire thing about it, right? The the Bible is built on these little small truths that illustrate a larger truth. And, you know, the Jews making the land rest every, you know, Mm -hmm. so many years, every seven years, you have a year off. And, and, you know, this, this, I believe, is, is God's type and we are, are, are having that same application, you know? So on these like little mini scales and this big scale, it's the same thing. We see it over and over and over again. We didn't see it change. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, as, as we kind of wrap this up, and we're, you know, this is a huge topic, but, you know, a lot of people are questioning like, you know, what is happening? Why are all these things taking place? You know, what the pandemic, you know, disasters, you know, climate change, all these things. And I, I think really, when you look at the Bible, like it's the greatest roadmap that gives us the greatest confidence for what's happening now and what's about to take place, even though we may not fully see it. Like you kind of hear rumblings, you see little, you know, tidbits, you know, with the papers are releasing this statement or this particular encyclical or whatever it may be. And, but still, even at this point, a lot of people I think would be like, nah, like, are you serious? Like there's no, no way. way, there's no yeah. way, there's no way, there's no way that the, the Catholic church would be the one to rule the world in the end and that the United States would be the right hand arm of the papacy. There's just no way. Mm. But, they but, in but the Bible has laid out this, this prophetic roadmap to a T yeah. and, and you know, not, none of us are prophets, but we have prophecy That's that right. you can mm-hmm. really, you know, trust and, and put your full confidence in. And, and this is what's amazing. It'll be interesting to see how these things play out because, you know, maybe someone will come back and watch the show, you know, in the future sometime and be like, you know what? Those guys were like spot on. Well, it wasn't us. Yeah. You know, it's the fact that God has foretold that this is what, this is where we're headed. This is what's happening, yeah. you know, and that there will be this battle between true religion and false religion. And everybody's going to have to make a decision. Where do we stand? You know? You know, like the Revelation eighteen twenty three says, you know, the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in the and the, 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 the light of the bridegroom shall shine no more at all in the end for the voice of the bridegroom will not be heard, but by thy sorceries were all nations deceived, right? Right. I mean, we've dealt with a lot of sorcery topics on mm-hmm. our, uh, uh, on our shows, um, you know, all of the deceptions that are constantly coming out of Hollywood or whatever. But, wow. it, but it talks about the whole world will wander after this entity. Yeah. This entity has this power over the entire world. They'll, they'll follow after the beast. And then it's very interesting to me that prophecy, this is why I like prophecy, when you understand the prophetic um, storyline and, and where the Bible illustrated all these things that were going to come about, God did, isn't going to do anything until he reveals it to his prophets first, right? Mm-hmm. So wouldn't you think that, that Satan's biggest opus deception would not be somehow told in the Bible and that we can actually look at the Bible and know what's coming down the pipe. Mm, right. And so, you know, when you see all these things, like I, I, I can remember um, watching, um, you know, the, the, the Catholics, you know, the Pope having more and more screen time yeah. coming out more yeah. in, our, in, our, in our world and being more involved in big political things and arenas, like you said. Take a selfie speaking with today, and... yeah, Speaking about the UN. I mean, when we were a kid, did you ever see yeah. anything like this? And so when you see that from the Great Reformation, you understand how the, the, the Protestant movement, you know, pinned the, that system of worship as the end time beast. And then all of a sudden we like, you know, are seeing this happen in our day and age. It's, it's pretty wild to watch it play so out. So talk about what a Protestant is then. Right, you're protesting where the you know the 
the Catholic system was really gaining the power and the control. But if you look now, the Protestants have forgotten what it means to be a Protestant, and the biggest names, the biggest mega churches that get the screen time, they're saying it's time to unite. They're not you know? protesting anymore. Yeah, yeah, they're actually saying. I mean, I've seen Kenneth Copeland That's invite right. the Pope. I've seen Todd White say, uh, you know, let's join hands with the Catholics. I've seen Francis Chan have a bunch of Catholic priests come out and pray over him. All these big name. Protestants, yeah. supposed Protestants, are not Protestants anymore, and they're it, uniting with the beast. And a lot of it is because we just don't know, know history. Yeah. yeah, you know, we've forgotten history. So here's a really like important point that just like hit me like a ton of bricks last year. The the Protestant Reformation was essentially fought over the interpretation of the Bible. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. That's what it was. That what it essentially was about. It's either this system says no. I'm interpreting it for you. This is what it means. Mm-hmm. Or you're able to open its pages. God will communicate with you as you read it through the power of the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. and help you learn and understand what it mm-hmm. is that he's getting at. That, that was what the Protestant Reformation has fought over. This yeah. How freedom to interpret the Bible. Again, essentially. boiling it down to freedom of choice. Mm-hmm and forced conscience. Yeah. yeah. And and with the whole climate thing, you know, a lot of people will look at that and say, well, that's a hoax, you know. The planet isn't really falling apart or whatever. I think it is falling apart. Yeah. I think it's it's crying out and right. saying, yeah, I mean, this is it's it's being destroyed. So I you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't go so far as to say, you know, well, it's going to happen anyway. Don't do anything. Right. Yeah. I think if it's in your power, you know, be responsible. Right. If it's in your power, recycle, you right. know, use more glass at your home instead of like plastics and stuff, you yeah. know. Yeah. There's a there's a whole like huge thing in the ocean. There's just this giant mass of, of plastic. I mean, it's yeah. massive. I mean, it's right. so big. It's just like heartbreaking to think of that, right. yeah. you know. Have you there's... seen the documentary called Age of Stupid? It's all about that, that, so check that out. Human history is littered with the corpses of people who had stuff worth stealing. Animals. Water. Shiny things. Fertile land. Spices. Mm, not mixed slice. Tea. But when it came to stuff worth pinching, one continent had it all. Ivory, copper, cotton, rubber, wood, tin, gold, diamonds, and people. As cheap energy, slaves were unbeatable until a less troublesome energy source was discovered and a new era began. Human numbers increased five times over and with each person wanting more and more stuff, oil became the resource worth fighting for all around the world. Skiing in the desert. Heating the air. Lighting empty offices. Energy is so ridiculously cheap, it makes perfect economic sense to just piss it away. China is the new bad guy, because they are building a new power station every four days. But a quarter of that energy makes stuff for us. Western companies pay Chinese workers crap wages to make crap plastic toys, then ship them to Europe and wrap them in more plastic. Punters drive to the out-of-town megastore in their gas guzzlers. Plastic toy in plastic box goes into plastic bag. Two days later, toy is broken and back it goes to a Chinese landfill where it stays for about hmm, 50,000 years. And they now each consume twice as much energy as a European, nine times more than a Chinese person, 15 times more than an Indian, and 50 times more than someone from Kenya. If all six and a half billion people here on Earth consume like Europeans or Japanese, 
We'd need two more planets worth of resources. If everyone consumed like Americans, Australians and Canadians, we'd need another four. And in 2040 or so, when there's about nine billion of us, we'll need two more again. Capitalism's only goal is ever-expanding growth, but ever-expanding growth on just the one not-expanding planet is impossible. The question I've been asking is, why didn't we save ourselves when we had the chance? So, you know, we're not saying don't just, just right. throw your hands up and don't do anything. Right. You know, be responsible as much as in your power. Yeah. Um, and recognizing that the ship has already struck the iceberg. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the ship is going down. It is going to go down. And, and, and this is the biggest thing is that, you know, what's, what's important, you know, it's like at some point, you know, people milling about on the Titanic, they're, you know, they're still concerned about the band playing and the mm -hmm. lights are on and mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're wearing their fancy clothing and they don't want to put on that life jacket because it would, you know, mm -hmm. ruin my fashion, you know, for the yeah. evening or whatever it would, you know, multiplicity of reasons mm -hmm. that in the end cost them their lives. Yeah. You know, like they won't get in, they won't get into that tiny little life raft. Why? Because it's, it's going over that yeah. dark edge into like the icy cold water. I'm, mm. I'm comfortable here. Yeah. You know, and so like, you know, there's this, there's this, um, you know, really this, this need for Christians to, to wake up and understand where we are yeah. in that continuum of time, because I know it seems like the lights are still on right now and the band's playing, mm -hmm. but we're out of time. Like this, the ship is going down and, and what, where, then, then that, like, what decision are we going to have in trying to warn others? Mm -hmm. You know, like it's time to get in a lifeboat. And, and that's why it's, I'm going to say this again. It's really important to study prophecy. Yeah. Like you've got to know where we're at. If you don't understand these concepts, there's a lot of channels. There's a lot of things. Start investigating it. Start with just literally getting on your hands and knees and praying, God, show me uh, the path. Yeah. God will direct yeah. your path. He'll show you. You'll all of a sudden be stumbling across some other ministry. You know, click on those links and, and, and watch, you know. Uh, ask God for guidance and the Holy Spirit for guidance to understand where we're at because God has never, ever done anything major without letting the people know first. Mm -hmm. Right. That's true. And study Daniel and Revelation. That's right. <laughs> Daniel and Revelation. Without knowing who the last power is going to be, then you, you really don't know where this is all going. Right, right. But with the statue of Nebuchadnezzar, the legs of iron were Rome and the feet were of Rome and Rome and clay, and it was a, a mingling of iron and clay. So we know that that's the last kingdom before Christ comes and sets up his. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the things we've brought up today shows that this kingdom is getting more and more screen time, more and more publicity, making the cover of Time magazine and all that stuff. It just seems a little weird, you know? And the world is beginning to look for the reasons why the world is falling apart. Who's doing this? Yeah. Oh, wow, we forgot God. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, there's a man that steps on the scene that claims to be the authority in the room of the everything God, sits mm -hmm. in the place of God, claiming himself to be God. Which you just mentioned, we talked about many will come in my name, saying I am him and all that. That's what every pope does. Mm -hmm. I am the Father. I mean, I, I literally saw um, like a big UN type setting, like a bunch of government officials and they announced the Pope as the Holy Father and everybody stands and applauds. You're talking about like Obama and people are like, yeah, the Holy Father. You're like, what? Yeah. I mean, you see those videos of all the politicians like yeah. literally kissing his hand and stuff. Yeah. I mean, one after another, every world power and you're just mm. like, wow. Nobody's, no, no other religious entity has that kind of, of pull with the world. And so it's, it's so strange that Christians, you can go to them and say, do not commit adultery, do not um, disrespect your parents, do not do this, do not take God's land in vain, no other idols. Say everything, don't kill. They'll say yes, 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 don't covet. They'll say everything, yes to. The minute you bring up Sabbath, we're not under the law, we're, mm -hmm. we're away from the law, then why do you keep Sunday? Well, Sunday the, was changed, the Sabbath was changed, but I thought you said we weren't under the law. We are under the law, and it's, they always find those that are choosing not to open their ears, they're choosing to turn around and find excuses, create excuses for why we don't keep the proper Sabbath. And I'm just like, 
it, it, there's no reason. If you're going to follow the other laws, why not this law? Why is this one changed? Shouldn't the other ones be changed? If the Sabbath was changed, shouldn't it be that thou shalt not kill? Unless they really, really anger you. Thou <laughs> shalt not steal. Unless you actually want it. Don't commit adultery unless your spouse is not making you happy mm. anymore. Like, right. literally, there's no yeah. reason for you to go through and mess with the Ten Commandments or mess with one ten, one of the Ten Commandments and say, oh, all the others are the same, but this one's different. It yeah. doesn't make sense logically. Yeah. God, God in His infinite wisdom began the Fourth Commandment with remember yeah. mm -hmm. because He knew that humanity would be so easy to forget. And, and I do want to say this, though, because I, I don't want to, you know, leave the conversation with any sort of slam of anyone that, that, that is involved in, in Catholicism. Yeah. This is not against, you know, we're not saying anything negative towards people that are a part of, of, of the Catholic Church, so to say. God has his people in every single yeah. denomination. I believe that. Right. I, we're specifically speaking of these leaders. There is a group that knows what they're doing mm -hmm. and... I mean, in prophecy and in the Reformation, I mean, when you study that out, yeah. we didn't get that wrong, yeah. you know what I mean? And so there, there, there is a real reason to be, um, you know, alarmed with the leadership, but that doesn't mean that just because you're, you know... It, it's a system problem. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, it's a system problem. And, you know, just, just because Nebuchadnezzar is king of Babylon doesn't mean that he's unreachable. Right. Yeah. And, and that's what's powerful, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the king of Babylon was one because yeah. of Daniel's witness. Mm -hmm. Can you believe, could you, I mean. In, what it, yeah, it's the same way as like, if you're if you're Democrat and you look at Republicans, yeah. all Republicans aren't like Trump. Right. And if you look at Republicans that are looking at Democrats, right. all Democrats aren't like Obama. You know, yeah. it's like, yeah. you know, you got to learn to, to deal with people and, and see them for who they really are, not not what they're necessarily, their system represents. Right. Um, there's always been two, though, throughout history, two yeah. sides. You know, like my grandfather, he was former, he used to be Catholic. He said that it's not the people. The people are great people. He yeah. said it's the system. It's the people. That, yeah. It's the leaders. He yeah. said that. And I'm like, this is from the mouth of a person who was an altar boy who I believe doing probably not, not to become a priest, but an altar boy. And he knew right. the Eucharist and he knew the like Tobit and the Book of Tobit and all that, those things. He was really into it. And he's telling me this. It's not the people. It's the leadership. Okay. You know the, who the three most recognized people in the world are? Mickey, the Pope, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, Mario from Mario no. Brothers. You got one of them. <laughs> <laughs> President of the United States. Hmm. Um, what, Queen any, of England. Any of them? And the Pope. Oh, well. Three uh, most recognized faces. Recognized. Faces, current faces yeah, in the world. On the, on the planet. She's been wow. isn't, that, isn't that fascinating? You know, that's, that's, that's two out of the major yeah. key players in the, in the end of time, the United mm -hmm. States and the that's papacy, true. right? Yeah, that's powerful. The yeah. whole world one. And one was really born out of the other. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's... Man, we need, we need some uh, courageous laborers yeah. today. You know, we need some Elijahs. We do. And, and, and you think about what Elijah must have felt standing on the top of Mount Carmel, mm -hmm. you know, by himself, like literally thinking, he went up to there thinking that I'm the only one. Yeah. I mean, all these people are you know, on the other side. But look at the miraculous um, display of God's mm. true power and, and that he's the one in control of this whole thing that, uh, you know, Elijah got to witness and be a part of that. Yeah. And I think that's kind of where the end of the end time people are going to be at too. It is really God. We need to know, are we doing what God wants us to do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not what any other system or any other thing. Like, go to your Bible, go to the source of truth, read that for yourself. I really think that, you know, you guys need to investigate the subject of the Sabbath. Just look into it. Read the verses. Do some digging on it. And more importantly, if you start out that study, pray that God leads mm. you in that study mm. and shows you the truth. And I believe that if you really honestly are a truth seeker and praying, God will not fail you. It's fascinating about um, this chapter of Revelation 13 and you have Elijah on Mount Carmel. That miracle that was performed was to confirm um, an already existing truth, yeah. mm. right? So an already existing truth. You get to Revelation 13, it's the other way around. The, mir the miracle is used to confirm something that's not yeah. already an existing truth. 
Right. Right. It's kind of it's kind of putting the heart the cart before the horse. Right. And it's like, well, see the miracle, therefore this must be true. Instead mm-hmm. of this is already true, here's the miracle to back it up. Right. And the way they're described, very similar. Now, whether it plays out in Revelation 13 exactly like, you know, it did in Elijah's time, where it's fire from heaven, I don't know exactly. Revelation is full of signs and symbols. Yeah. But it's interesting that they're described the same way. Mm. They're both over the issue of worship. Wow. But right. you have to think about what's the most important thing. The most important thing is, what did God say? Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and that's because the devil can't, he's, he, he can't create, he can't be original. He can only reverse mm-hmm. engineer. Mm-hmm. So he can only go mm-hmm. back and try to, mm-hmm. you know, manipulate. It's, int- what's it's interesting you said, you know, Elijah was like, I'm the only one. That's a parallel for where we're going to be. The remnant, the remnant which keep the commandments of God, they're the ones that Satan hates and is going to make war against. So like you said, study this out. You want to be in that remnant, even if it means getting your head cut off. I mean, Satan hates you and he's coming after you. Um, We are the biggest threat, those who obey God rather than men. Because those people are literally a walking, breathing demonstration of the power of God. Like in Elijah's experience, that fire coming down from heaven, it was like the people immediately saw that and just went, okay, he's God, right? Mm -hmm. So when we have a group of people that love God so much that they love not their own lives, even unto death, Mm. then people Mm. will look at that and say, that's the glory of God. Look at that. The character of God. I mean, it's what it's all about. I mean, we're we're coming to the final showdown between the character of God and the character of of man as displayed in satanic influence. And that's the polarization that we're seeing. And so whose character will we choose, Mm -hmm. you know, today? God's or a whole host of options. I think it's a great place to leave it. We hope you guys enjoyed this little discussion. Well, it wasn't really little. This is probably a a much bigger discussion than we can handle in an hour. Um, But please, if you have any questions, we'd love to hear from you. Um, But seriously consider um, looking into this subject, looking into the the study of the Reformation. Um, You know, understand history, look back. And uh, especially if you are a Protestant, you know, and and you're still in a Protestantism, uh, so to say, um, make sure you know what you believe and why you believe it. Mm. And uh, we'll put some links in the description below for you to follow, find the study. Hopefully you'll do it. And uh, thank you once again for tuning in and hope you like this video. Subscribe to our channel if you haven't before. And of course, uh, check us out. We got lots of ways to support our channel, Patreon, buying t-shirts, you name it. Uh, We thank you guys so much for your love and support. So we'll catch you guys later. See ya.